Um, today is March 31st, 2019. My name is Ruben Bakian. I am interviewing Ward Abro for the Voces Oral History Project. Um, thank you, Professor Abro, for letting us interview you today. Um, we ex as we explained earlier, the uh, interviews will be hosted on the Nettie Lee Latin American Collection at the University of Texas campus. Uh, if there's anything you want to discuss, uh, and I'm not asking you about it, please let me know. And if, uh, and of course, if you wish to answer, if you do not wish to answer, answer any specific questions, uh, that's totally up to you. Um, so let's begin. Okay. Um, so earlier you told me you were born in San Antonio, correct? Um, uh huh. But you moved around quite a bit. Can right. You, um, tell me uh, why you found to move so much, and uh, what are some of the places you uh, you lived at? Okay, I was born in San Antonio, actually uh, in what is now the Emily Morgan Hotel, but was in the, uh, the uh, uh, medical arts building, or, and they had a hospital up on the top floors. Uh, but we didn't live there very long. My father was native of San Antonio. My mother had moved there. They, that's where they met. My older sister actually was born in Corpus Christi. Because uh, this was, uh, you know, coming out of the Depression, my father was uh, did a lot of different different jobs. I don't even know all the jobs he had, but I know we lived in Austin for a time. We were back here in Corpus for a time. We were in Bryan for a time. Before that, he had, uh, you know, he he worked for meat packing uh, business with his father-in-law. He worked. Uh, as a salesman for Grandma Cookie Company, uh, and then we got to uh, to Tennessee, where I went to uh, elementary school. Actually, I started school in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, because my father was volunteered in World War II, and was at Fort Knox for a while before he went overseas. So we lived in the e, what they call E Town. And I actually started first grade there, but then we came back to Bristol, Tennessee, where I kind of kind of grew up, because I went through elementary school there, and I have fond memories of Bristol. It's a kind of the country music capital, so I'm a hillbilly at heart, I guess. But uh, uh, we lived there, and he he uh, my father tended to when he got into something, kind of overdid it sometimes because he had an uh, insurance agency and expanded too fast or something, I don't know. Uh, and then he was a service manager for a, uh, a automobile dealer there. And uh, he uh, uh, met a man from Wyoming that was opening a new automobile agency. And so we moved to Rollins, Wyoming when I was in sixth grade. And what year was that? It would have been uh, in 1940. Oh, Lordy, I'd have to figure that out. I, I skipped a grade, so I was a, a young person in class. So sixth grade, six, uh, I was in the sixth grade, so I would have been about 11, so it would have been about 49 or so. I think it was about 49, and we moved to Rollins, Wyoming, and where I, I went to junior high, uh, started anyway, and uh, he, he worked for this automobile dealer for a while that was just opening, then he opened his own garage, and then he moved to, uh, to be the service manager for a GMC dealer in San Angelo, Texas. And so we came to San Angelo. I was in ninth grade, or I was just ending eighth grade, I think, because I went to uh, Robert E. Lee Junior High in San Angelo, and then I went to San Angelo High School, graduated in 1955. Mm -hmm. And he, my father later got back into sales, and that's what he did a lot. And, and they moved to Fort Stockton for a while, but I'd already left. I left. I graduated when I was 17, and uh, like a lot of young guys, you want to get out of town, so I basically left home at 17. I went back one summer, but that's the last time that I ever really went back. 
although I was still dependent economically, but, uh, but I left and went to Houston. So... And that was um, for undergrad at U of H, correct? I did my undergrad at the University of Houston. I was, uh, uh, both my sister and I in high school were very active in the uh, journalism department. I had a great, great teacher there at San Angelo High School, Ed Cole, who came out of the newspaper business and, and, and uh, we, my sister and I had both been editor of the high school paper and then I went off to uh, Houston, majored in, uh, in uh, journalism, well, you know, I was probably too young to go to school, but I had a good time. That's good. I want to jump back to your earlier years of school. Um, could you talk about your about your classmates uh, throughout your first year? Um, did you notice any difference uh, differences between how Spanish speaking students were treated at different schools? There what now? Uh, differences between Spanish speaking students. Um, opposed to others at the different schools you attended? Uh, in, uh, in, in, in elementary school, we, I can't remember any Spanish-speaking students because this is East Tennessee. Right, right. And, uh, you know, we had a tamale salesman on the street, but uh, I don't remember any Spanish-speaking students. Mm -hmm. And then in Wyoming, uh, I can't remember any. But then in San Angelo uh, High School, I had several uh, uh, several friends uh, who were, uh, San Angelo was still segregated pretty much. We, in fact, the blacks, there was a black separate black, black school when I was in high school. Uh, so it was not, not integrated, but the, the Mexican students did go to, uh, to the schools, to San Angelo High School. And actually, one summer, I didn't work a whole lot, but I, I uh, worked uh, at, uh, for a while on an ice truck, mm -hmm. delivering ice. And that was mainly in the barrio, because, you know, they didn't have uh, refrigerators, you know, so they had uh, ice. Uh, so, so I didn't meet a lot of people, but, you know, I did become aware. And I did have some friends. Actually, I found out many, many years later uh, that uh, one of my friends was, I think it's the uncle of Angela Valenzuela, who teaches at your place. Oh, I see. <laughs> he's a, she's a professor, a very well-known professor at UT Austin. But I did, I did not know her there. She came along later, much younger. But anyway, so, so I didn't deal with... Uh, I did at... Um, at uh, San Angelo, mm -hmm. and then uh, probably my first, I went off to Houston with a uh, classmate, a friend from high school. We, that's why I decided to go to the University of Houston. My, uh, my mother wanted me to go to Angelo Junior College. It was a junior college then, but I, threatened to join the Navy and she didn't call my bluff. Uh, so I went off to Houston with this friend of mine and his grandmother was from Greece. So I was in the Greek community in Houston for about a year. But I was, you know, barely, I was just 17 years old when I went off and I got, uh, well, I, I had a good time for a couple of years. My, my transcript shows that, that I had a good time. I want to jump back to your time in San Angelo. Um, you you mentioned working uh, at delivering ice um, and jobs in the barrio. Did you wonder about racial disparities as you were growing up? Uh, that what now? Did you wonder about racial disparities when you as you were growing up? Uh, not a not a whole lot. You know, it, it was not uh, not really uh, part of my part of my life, even though I grew up in, basically, you know, in Texas and grew up in, in Tennessee. Uh, East Tennessee was a, kind of a unique place, the mountain areas, uh, not a lot of uh, minorities there, but, you know, we interacted through stores and things like that, but I, I didn't have any real acquaintances. 
my mother was uh, was uh, very uh, you know they were they were not really active uh, politically but but I, I remember as a child in a, looking at a Sears catalog uh, I, I used the N word. And my mother very quickly took me aside and explained why you don't do that. And I don't think I ever have since in 70 years since. <laughs> because, you know, she impressed that on me very much. That, uh, so, that, you know, but I didn't have, I didn't have that many contacts. Do you, um, do you know how old you were when that incident happened? No, I was elementary school, elementary school, so I don't know, yeah. Um, could you speak more about the, you mentioned that the schools were segregated in um, San Angelo. San Angelo was still, the, the, there was a separate school for the African Americans, uh, but uh, uh, the, again, most of the, uh, the Mexican population in San Angelo was, uh, was uh, you know, in the barrio and uh, segregated residentially. I don't remember any uh, contact with, uh, you know, I didn't have a lot of uh, social friends. Uh, it's still, uh, still a very uh, well. West Texas was uh, still. Uh, it's different from what I found when I went to South Texas many years later. How so? I, I, the the uh, the rigid. Uh, I've, I've found in South Texas there's more of a, even though there was still the racism and discrimination, there was more contact, kind of that old patron mentality in some ways or something. Could you um, explain that patron mentality? Well, that's what you would find in, in South Texas where you have, you have more interaction between the Anglo and the Latino or whatever term you want to use, but there is this built-in idea of superiority, that sort of thing, in a, you know, in a kind of a, what I would call something of, you know, there's the, the boss and the employee and the patron coming, you know, coming out of the, well, Mexican society, you know, it's more classism, but there's racism there too. Could you um, tell me about uh, your teachers and principals uh, growing up and going to school, uh, school? Were you encouraged to go to college by any of them? Or, uh, there was I what now? Were you encouraged to uh, go to higher education in college by any of your teachers? Uh, no, I don't remember any specific teacher. I think it was kind of assumed that I would go to college. My sister, my oldest sister was a was uh, it's kind of ironic because she was an overachiever, you know, and she went on some foreign exchange program, and then, and then she went off to uh, Texas Women's University, but came back <laughs> after about a semester, and we thought, you know, we thought that she would be the one that would uh, achieve more uh, academically. But uh, she was uh, very uncomfortable and came back home. Later, got married and and uh, didn't pursue. But uh, you know, it was just assumed that I would go to school. But where, you know, the, they weren't. And well, back then, you know, it wasn't all the uh, uh, emphasis on the uh, scores and things like that. I didn't have to take SAT or anything like that. You know, I just decided I was going to go to, uh, with my friend to Houston, live with his grandmother. So that's what got me to the University of Houston. I didn't really know much about it. And then it was still private then, actually, when I started. It was not a state school yet. And it was segregated, too. I used to drive through Texas Southern every day to get to class at Houston. Father was a World War II veteran. Um, how do you think his experience uh, shaped the way he uh, he raised you? Now what? Speak up. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, I get it up. Uh, no, no. Um, um, 
What expectations were put on you by your parents? You mentioned that your father was a World War II veteran. Uh, how do you think his experience influenced the way he raised you? Uh, he, uh, you know, I, uh, I was aware. In fact, he sent back all kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how he got it in. I had a, a, a helmet and a bayonet and a rifle and all kind of things that he sent back. But no, he had very positive uh, feelings about uh, his, uh, his time in the military. Uh, in fact, I've, I've said before that I don't think he ever was uh, really, this is, uh, well, of course, he had moved around quite a bit before that, but I think that, that uh, contributed to his, uh, his kind of discontent and he drank too much and alcoholic, became alcoholic. But uh, uh, that, uh, uh, again, uh, I don't think he was ever really totally content. I mean, the, the, the World War II experiences became for him kind of the best years of his life, you might almost say. I, he never said that, but, you know, I got that impression. Why do you think, what gave you that impression? I don't know why, you know, he, he just, uh, Again, the fact that he did move around a lot. He was very, he was supportive, but, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, he was one of the people who probably, uh, probably should have gone to college. He, he graduated from Harlandale High School in San, in San Antonio, and, but the opportunities just weren't there at that time. And uh, his, uh, his grandfather, uh, had had been a uh, actually a pretty prominent uh, uh, theologian, and had to position. I forget. I, you know, I, I haven't followed all this, but I I know that he uh, he he had one of his his first son. He sent to college, and he did he didn't do well, and he goofed off, and so he never. He said he wouldn't send any more. So my grandfather didn't get to go to college. And the same thing kind of happened with my father, I think. Because he could have, you know, he was, uh, he, he was, you know, he, he, again, as a service manager, as a salesman, that sort of thing, he worked with a lot of people of, uh, you know, working people, that sort of thing, was very, very happy in that. but. Uh, but uh, I think he was frustrated a little bit there. Did, so he wasn't encouraged to go to college. You said he was, you assumed you were going. Did he encourage you to go? I mean, they had just, I don't remember any specific encouragement. It was just some assumed that I would go. Just the assumption is that, uh, you know, I would go. And so, and they were supportive, you know, they, they, uh, uh, Paid my paid my way even when I was uh, during my animal house days when I was not performing very well academically they still continued to support me. You um and going back to um, your time at University of Houston, um, what was uh, you, you mentioned the animal house days? What was your undergraduate like? Uh, undergraduate life like uh, what organizations were you part of? I was, uh, again, I was a journalism major, and that's about the only thing I did well in, except a history class. That came in later, but I did do well. But I, uh, I uh, lived with this, uh, uh, with my high school friend and his grandmother, who was, like I say, from Greece. So we were involved in the Greek community quite a bit. Uh, we used to go to wedding receptions, a big Greek community in, in, in Houston. We used to go to wedding receptions uh, almost every weekend, it seemed like, because uh, you know we didn't know who was getting married, but it was always Greek dancing and drinking, and where else could a 17-year-old go to drink, you know? And uh, so we had a good time. Uh, and, I, and then I pledged a fraternity, and I got involved in a fraternity. And uh, uh, I, uh, second year, moved into the fraternity house, which uh, they were not that well established at Houston. They had just become national, 
at Houston, and they didn't have big houses, but you know there were there were uh, a few of us. And uh, this is uh, was interesting too. I did not realize it at the time, but uh, it was Pi Kappa Alpha that uh, we had one of the uh, uh, s uh, several of the well, not a, not that many, but two or three of the uh, members, including one of the uh, in my pledge class, were Mexican American, which was unusual at that time. <laughs> yeah, for because uh, fraternities and sororities were pretty uh, pretty anglicized. When I went to A and I, in fact, it was totally many years later even. What can you recall about those uh, experiences in the fraternity? Huh? The what? Tell me about those uh, experiences being in the fraternity and having some of uh, some Mexican American uh, uh, brothers as well. Well, you know, we we uh, we did. Uh, uh, there was a tradition that uh, we went off uh, on a, a sneak, the pledge class, and we went to the the border, and uh, that's when I realized that I did not, this is how much I know, that uh, Joe Longoria was a Mexican. I didn't even know he was a Mexican, you know, I didn't, that's how limited my experience was. Uh, how, did you, how did you come to realize that? When, uh, when he was in the valley, he was speaking Spanish, you know, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't even, I didn't even know Longoria was a Spanish name, you know, so that's how naive I was. What other organizations were you part of besides fraternity? Uh, the the school the the school paper. I worked. You know, I was active in that. Um, once you're in Houston, uh, did you notice uh, any you mentioned that it was segregated still. Did you notice any uh, of the social political? Did you notice anything about the social and political climate uh, in the uh, uh, of, of the area here? Uh, Houston, when I was there, was kind of a sleepy southern town with a, a large uh, black population. And in fact, the fraternity houses were in a, were, were buying houses in the transitional neighborhoods that were moving from basically Jewish to black. And that's why they were available. <laughs> Some of these big homes fairly inexpensively in the McGregor area and over there. And so I was aware, you know, I was aware of the uh, the black population much more. You know, we went to a, uh, went to a, I remember we went to Arthur, the, the fellow I was with, my high school friend. We went to a big show in the Coliseum there that featured all these great stars, you know, Fats Domino and Joe Turner and Laverne Baker and all that were from the rock and roll, the uh, and the um, the bottom part of the Coliseum was black, the upper part was white. It was totally segregated. Uh, you know, you could go see the show, but you couldn't really participate. So it was still a very segregated society. And like I say, University of Houston was not even integrated. When I went there, how was that um, segregation enforced at the, at the Coliseum? Was it, was it uh, by law, or just kind of unspoken that they just kind of? It was. It was. Uh, you know. I guess it was. Uh, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't think to question it. White people sat here. The black people sat there. And you know, so it was. A, it was still. Uh, you know, we. I, I, like I say, I drove through Texas Southern every day. To get to school, black school, but uh, I was not not really I'm not really aware of of things that much. Um, so after um, your your time in Houston, um, you went for your P, uh, graduate degree, right? Correct. Well, I, I no, I, I got sidetracked on my way to the bachelor's because. Oh. Because yeah, because uh, uh, I uh, got married, and uh, I had to go to work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I 
I had, uh, I got married in my third year at Houston and I had 60 hours of credit and so I had to go to work. So I went to work for Prudential Insurance Company. I had a home office there. And I uh, uh, went to night school. Houston had a big night school, night school program then, much bigger than it is now. Although somewhat limited, but I, uh, I changed my major to history because that's what I had really liked. And uh, I like journalism too, but I, you know, I figured I wasn't gonna do that uh, journalism. And I, I changed my major to history and I was uh, uh, going to night school. I minored in journalism since I had all those hours anyway. And I also had a, a minor in philosophy and religion partly because of interest and partly because what was available at night school. <laughs> I took a lot of courses because they, I, I went year round because they had night school in the, in the uh, summer. And so I got my bachelor's degree at night and uh, fortunately had done well once I got serious. So my grade average was good enough that I could get in graduate school. So I just kept going to graduate school at night. Right, at so U of H. At U of H, so I did it all at night. Mm -hmm. And what, what year was that in order you, that you received the bachelor's? I graduated in 1960 with the bachelor's and 62 with the master's. Mm -hmm. And then? By that time I had two kids and. and then, okay, after, after Houston you went to up north, correct? Mm -hmm. You went uh, north, right? Oh, no, I went to Arizona. Arizona. No, I, I decided, you know, I was a, uh, I'd been at Prudential almost five years, and I'd changed, I started to just kind of a clerical job, but then, you know, I did have some writing skills, I guess, from journalism, so I became a sales promotion writer in, a, in that department. And uh, it was a little, you know, it was interesting, uh, some of that activity. But uh, I decided I wasn't going to do that the rest of my life. And by that time, I was interested in, in history. And uh, my interest was I took a course on the history of Mexico from a professor named Jack Haddock, who uh, was a UT graduate. And Haddock was a, was a good man. He was very supportive, uh, did well. He was not the most exciting professor around, but, but he, he, he interested me. Actually, I took a course in Russian history. <laughs> thought about that, but Mexico just uh, seemed to interest me more. So I decided I would pursue uh, Latin America. And I was, you know, I didn't know that much about academia, but uh, I figured schools in the Southwest would uh, would be more likely to support me. I talked to UT Austin. I actually went up there, but they didn't have anything available for me. And uh, I applied to, uh, I applied, I think, to about five schools in, uh, in the Southwest. And I, I got a, I got an offer for a quarter time position at the University of Colorado. And I went and talked to my advisor and, you know, should I accept this? And, and I, I guess, yes, you better accept anything you get. <laughs> but, uh, but in the meantime, then I got an offer, a, a, a response from Arizona and they offered me a half-time assistantship, you know, teaching assistantship. And so I, that changed my mind, so. Went to Tucson, quit working. My wife and two kids and I loaded everything up in a, and pulled a trailer out to Tucson. Didn't have a place to live or anything until we got there. And she went to work, which is, you know, my half-time assistantship didn't, didn't support us, obviously, so she had to work. So I had three years, I spent three years in Tucson. 
What university was that again? The university of Arizona. Okay. Right. Um, did you notice any difference between the social, cultural um, uh, climate there in, in Arizona opposed to South Texas and Houston? Oh yeah, yeah. Arizona was very, very different than, than Texas. I. But, uh, you know, I liked Arizona from the beginning. We didn't have, uh, you know, uh, even though I was in Latin American history, uh, there weren't many students. I think I can only remember one graduate student who was uh, named Camacho, Leo, Leo Camacho, because the students uh, studying uh, Latin America were mainly Anglo. This is something I came back to later, and in fact, uh, did a, a paper on that one time on the uh, on the fact that uh, you know the Latin American studies people in the U.S. were were Anglo mainly, people who were studying Latin America, and, uh, and and Tucson, of course, is southwestern, and there's more of the Spanish, the Spanish Southwest in Tucson. I uh, used to go to Nogales, uh, you know, 60 miles away to, to buy. Well, graduate, this is a time when the, uh, what was his name, wrote The Other America about poverty in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very, very influential on Johnson's War on Poverty, all this, and I'm trying to remember the author. But uh, there was a, uh, a mention in that book about poverty by choice, the difference. There's a big difference from poverty by choice and, you know, what you're forced into. And graduate school is kind of poverty by choice, you know. You, you're all in it together, you, most of you, you're enjoying it. And so we used to uh, uh, have uh, graduate functions, you know, graduate students get together and would uh, uh, go to Nogales to buy alcohol for the party. And back in those days in Arizona, you could bring back uh, whatever it is, a gallon or whatever, a quart or whatever, per person. Not by age, but per person. So we'd put my two little kids in the car and a friend of mine go down there and we could buy lots of alcohol for our party, you know, we could have a real party there. And uh, so, you know, I had those contacts with Mexico and I got more and more interested. I was taking classes. I was pretty naive, actually. Uh, I remember my first, as a, as a teaching assistant, I taught quiz sections where the, the lecturer lectured twice a week and then they broke them up into small sections. I remember my first one lasted about Maybe a minute I was terrorized because I never taught before or anything, you know. And actually, as a student, I'd always had a, a fear of speaking and you know that sort of thing. And so it was a, it was really a, a task. But I got more into it, and more into uh, uh, learning more about Latin America and Mexico, and became more, more uh, committed to the study of Mexico, which has been my life, you know, because. That's my my expertise and my publications and all that is on Mexican history. I um, I want to ask you. You mentioned about that, that class, um, the the Tabadista professor. That I got you really interested in in, in, in Mexico. Um, was that the moment where you decided you wanted to study Latin American studies? What, what well, it, probably the beginning of it. I, you know, I didn't make that decision right away. Actually, uh, like I said, I thought about Russian history for a while. But uh, no, I got more and more interested in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And, is that and did, a, did a master's thesis uh, on the foot and mouth disease in Mexico, which was a, 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 a kind of a unique time when the uh, American, uh, I talked to a lot of veterinarians who had gone to Mexico during that time is a fascinating story of um, of uh, that that experience, you know. And, and so by the time I got to Arizona, I was just uh, I didn't know a whole lot, but I the, the the I would work for the department chair Russell Ewing, was a uh, Mexicanist, and uh, 
Mario Rodriguez was the other Latin American that they had, and I had taken uh, courses from them, and uh, you know did well, and got more and more interested. Was that what, what, at what point did you realize that not everyone in society uh, was treated the same way? That what? That not everyone in society was treated the same way. I'm sorry. Uh, when did you realize that not everyone in society was treated the same way? Oh, well, I think I did that. I think I knew that pretty much from the beginning. I think I was, I think I was aware of that very much. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, my, uh, once I got into serious research, I was dealing with a radical movement, anarchists uh, in Mexico, and people who were concerned about the uh, the ills of society, and you know, so I, I was, I, you know, not not everybody who gets into biographical studies uh, necessarily adopts the views of <laughs> who they're studying, but most do, I think, and and certainly, you know, I I was very uh, very much in caught up in the uh, in the movements in Mexico. Which, which, which time? Tell me more about that. The anarchists, the revolutionaries, and people who you know were concerned about the ills of society. And one thing about one well, of the Flores Magon movement, which I've studied the most and published the most on, uh, has also come to be big with uh, the Mexican community in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, a lot of interest, a lot more that wasn't there when I began mm -hmm. by any means. Why do you think it's kind of come to grow in uh, interest? That what? Why do you think interest is growing? Well, because uh, because uh, this is, gets back to what I, s I said earlier that uh, that uh, you know there's uh, uh, people in this country, uh, people in both countries uh, don't don't necessarily know each other very well. But uh, this is kind of jumping ahead, but uh, I taught a course, for example, at the State University in Puebla on the Mexican in the United States. And uh, the lack of knowledge or the stereotypes that Mexicans have about Mexicans in the U.S. is, uh, is really amazing, and it worked both ways, you know. Uh, we can we can get into some of this later, but uh, but when when uh, when, when Mex Mexican American studies had to well still is not totally accepted, you know. But uh, but as it became a seen as a legitimate field of study, what happened is that these universities pushed students into either labor history or Western American history. So by the time you, you, know, you develop those areas, you don't have time to, to study. So, so Mexican American, as Mexican American studies developed, a lot of the Mexican American scholars uh, didn't know much about Mexico. And uh, you know this is uh, this has been a a why there's been kind of a, a eye opening on both sides. When did you t tell me about uh, after uh, Arizona? Um, the, you went to was that after that you went to A and I Pennsylvania? No, one year I I, uh, I I was on the job market uh, my last year, and I. Uh, I uh, got, uh, well, several schools were interested. I had several interviews. Uh, one was, uh, the first job offer I got was Appalachian State in North Carolina. And I went to Bowling Green for an interview. I went to East St. Louis for uh, Southern Illinois. And uh, then I got an offer from, from uh, uh, Wisconsin State University at River Falls, 
And I kind of was looking at the Midwest because I didn't, you know, kind of didn't know much about the Midwest. And then I got an offer from A and I, but I'd already accepted the offer from Wisconsin, which uh, paid quite well at the time, eighty-one hundred dollars. In fact, a professor, one of my professors, he was not one of my professors, but one of the professors in Arizona came up to me and said, congratulations, I just got a raise. I'm making almost as much as you're making. Because it was, you know, 8,100 was a big, a big uh, salary back then. So anyway, I went to Wisconsin. And it was a totally new, my, my wife actually had some relatives in Wisconsin. And so we, not, not where we were going, but uh, it was, you know, totally new. I had a brand new uh, third son born in Tucson. So he was born in March and I took, uh, you know, I started teaching there in September. So it was quite an experience. After living in, you know, far south to kind of towards the Midwest, how did the, you know, the, the Wisconsin compare to other places you've lived as far as it was very different. It was very different, you know. The the the, the small town, River Falls, a small town, twenty miles from St. Paul, Minnesota. It was not, you know, near. We could go to St. Paul and and Minneapolis for things, like. But it was a small rural town. Uh, very much, uh, you know, a different culture. They had the the farmer's bar and the student's bar and, the, you know, that's part of the going there to, to have a beer in Wisconsin, you know, is the, besides the dairy state. So you had a lot of milk-fed students. And I, had, uh, I had some interesting students. This was uh, 65, so the... Uh, War in Vietnam was a big issue for a lot of my students and everything. And there was a uh, radical sociology instructor from Chicago who uh, formed, got the students to form a chapter of SDS, the Students for Democratic Society. And uh, uh, they needed a sponsor and he was not, didn't have the, well, he had some problems, so I, I became the sponsor. You know, I was not really active in it, but but we, uh, we, you know, we were concerned about there were divisions there about the war. We we demonstrated against the war, and uh, he overslept. So the only two faculty that participated were me, and the only black person that lived there. There was only one black person in the whole town, and he was a sociology professor too, but he and I were the only faculty that we got roughed up, you know, with our in the war placards. And, and the next week there was a big, uh, a big, huge, uh, a big, much, you know, it's not that big a school, but a bigger demonstration uh, in uh, defending our rights. Not necessarily, we don't agree with them, but you know, we, uh, uh, we defend our right to make their views known. So I was, you know, I was active in that. What can you tell me about one of the most memorable demonstrations you were a part of in your career? Yeah, that was probably, yeah, that was probably it. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, I went back, uh, not, well, see, I left, I left after one year. I uh, I found out that well my wife was not terribly happy up there either neither one of us uh, you know I'd been that far from family and home or maybe the border I don't know what uh, the attraction was but I uh, I learned that uh, that A and I had not finished had not filled that position the year before so when I went to A and I. I mean, when I went to Wisconsin, a friend of mine who was a graduate student in political science went to A and I, and so I called him and said, "You know, what's it like down there? You know, 
And he was very positive. And then he said, but I'm leaving. <laughs> it's Charlie Cottrell is the name because he, he got a job at St. Mary's. So he was, a, uh, that was his alma mater. Charlie, in, in fact, became the first lay president of St. Mary's. And I still have contact with Charlie because he's, he's not president anymore, but he's still teaching. Uh, but anyway, he, he, uh, he said, and, and we're living in this uh, uh, big 10-room uh, house, paying $75 a month rent. I said, okay, tell the guy I'll rent his house. And so I took the job in, in Kingsville to uh, go. But then after the first year here, they had an NDA institute in, uh, in Wisconsin in the summer, and they invited me back. So I went back one summer to, to teach in that. But I moved to Kingsville and stayed there 35 years. Um, Longest I ever stayed anywhere. Uh, so you were at, you know, that's when I got to Texas A&I. Um, at the, towards the end of your time at A&I, you wrote the, the article, uh, A Gringo at the Awakening, uh, The Origins of the Chicano Movement at Texas A&I. Um, that was later published in the Journal of South Texas. What brought you to write this article? Why did I do that? Because uh, I, you know, I was uh, actually I never followed through, but I was uh, uh, kind of uh, there was you know more movement, uh, more discussion about the uh, Mexican American movement, and in fact, I apologize if you read the article for using awakening, but explained why I used the word awakening, you know, because. Uh, there was a book, in fact, an awakened minority. Manuel Servine did on uh, on the Chicano movement, and, and I, you know, I was uh, I kept seeing uh, there's there's been a lot of studies that that uh, ignored South Texas, and it's our own fault. How so? But uh, because we weren't doing, you know, the the people in South Texas were not not doing the uh, work. They were coming from California. You know, the California perspective is very different on the, uh, you know, on the development of the movement. And even today, you know, they're about to crusade for justice in, in Denver. We're marching for Cesar Chavez, who had, well, I shouldn't say this, but he gave up on South Texas, you know, and uh, because South Texas is, has been ignored. And so I was, you know, there lot, this, uh, this university, a and I, uh, did a lot, produced a lot, and it was ignored. So I, that's what, that's what inspired. I didn't follow through with it. I probably should have done more with it. But my my area again is Mexican history, and that's what I've published in, and continue to be active in. But uh, but I felt that uh, that the Mexican Americans were were in a sense being overlooked, and what particularly Kingsville. Not that, and again, as I pointed out in that article, it's not, it's not necessarily because Kingsville, the university took the lead. It's just that there was nowhere, <laughs> there was nowhere else to go. There was no other, there was no, no, no other place available. That's why all these people showed up, like Victor Nelson, that's been interviewed here. Mm -hmm. um, you, in the title, you refer yourself as a, as a gringo. Um, is this? Uh, how do you identify? If, uh, if not, uh, how, how do you identify yourself as? You know, I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, I don't. The, as part of the white privilege, you don't have to worry about how you identify yourself because you're, <laughs> you're, you know, you just accept it. I'm just uh, puro Anglo, so you know. Got some an English name, Albro is English, and some German, Irish, all kind of things back in there. But you know, just just Anglo. Mm -hmm. So, do you think being um, being that uh, just uh, having an Anglo identity um, at the awakening of the Chicano movement gave you a unique perspective? It uh, maybe gave me a perspective, but uh, uh, I, you know, I, uh, well, I, I, I uh, uh, 
my area of interest being Mexico and Mexican culture and, and uh, aspects of that that I saw in, uh, although with some differences with, uh, with Mexican American culture, caused me to be uh, sympathetic. And then my, you know, I'm, I'm a bleeding heart liberal and uh, have been all my life. So when I came to, uh, came to Kingsville, I was drawn to, I was still pretty young too, you know, for, for being in a position so I could identify with, with some of these people. And uh, uh, again, as I mentioned in there, when I, when I came, this was a year after Jose Angel Gutierrez had rather, after considerable conflict, had established the first student uh, college level uh, chapter of PASO, the political action of Spanish speaking. Uh, anyway, PASO had just been established. Now, Jose Angel was incidentally, Charlie Cottrell, who I mentioned earlier, was his mentor. In fact, uh, Jose Angel in the oral history project he did many years ago gives full credit to Charlie because he went to, uh, Jose Angel went to uh, St. Mary's then after A&I. And, &I. and, the, uh, I, and I, you know, as a new faculty, I was interested in what was going on. And um, I went to a meeting, a meeting of PASO, and the only officer that w was Mexican, was Latino, was Carlos Guerra. All the rest were liberal Anglos. And uh, so, you know, it was, a, it was the, the university was about 30 percent, uh, maybe, maybe 30 percent Mexican-American then. But most of that population was very, was very reluctant to get in, you know, involved and very, uh, still very intimidated. And they're first generation college and coming coming and there are no, no faculty that they could identify with. And uh, again, like I say, the fraternities and sororities were totally Anglo. So, so you know, for somebody like Jose Angel or then Carlos, and then the others came along a little bit later, like Victor, Emilio Zamora was, uh, was, was con contemporary of Victor, you know, he was in my, he was my student too. Emilio, who's going strong in Austin, I guess, yeah, and um, and and you know there there was it was just a, a kind of a interesting situation, and I was very sympathetic at uh, to the movement to the goals of the movement. Tell me more about about those goals. What, what was it like being the what? Tell me more about those goals. What was it like being a part of the organization? Well, I wasn't. I wasn't really part of the organization. I just went to the meeting, and you know, in fact, uh, uh, I think uh, after the meeting, I don't know if it was that first meeting. Pat Lawrence was one of the activists. He was a crazy guy. He's dead now, but he he and Carlos were kind of the the main radical leaders or spokesmen on campus. And uh, there were a few other Anglos uh, that were active. And uh, I, I know we went out to a restaurant, had a beer, which was shocking to them, the students, because that's back in the days when, you know, faculty didn't do that. And you had a dean of men who might be checking on you. Yeah, you dean of women, yeah, I mentioned that. Those, those offices are gone, but dean of women were famous for uh, for uh, you know, discriminate, telling the girls in the dorm, the dorm mothers, you know, don't go out with that. You'll ruin your reputation. You know, if you go out with a, a minority, that sort of thing. And, and again, there, as I said in that article, you know, a lot of people don't uh, don't believe that there's such a thing as institutional racism, but I, there is a devil, and there, and there was. There was a lot of institutional racism there in South Texas. Can you can you talk more on that? Tell me what, what did that look like uh, exactly? 
Well, the uh, the, the the town uh, was uh, becoming more integrated, but you still had the definite, uh, you know, ac across the tracks, like that that image of South Texas. Uh, you had the area that was the Mexican business area, actually, for a time. And then, uh, you know, where most of the Mexicans lived and where they went to school, the Mexican elementary school. Uh, so you had a, uh, I had a, uh, Kingsville was a strange place in that way. You had a traditional South Texas, but then you also have the culture of the King Ranch, which is this patron idea, because the Quineños, the people who grew up on the ranch, lived on the ranch, had a uh, were, had a different attitude, you know. The, there's a kind of a patron payon relationship, but but at, at the same time they supported they supported it. You know, they got their the people who lived on the ranch got their provisions of milk every month and meat and uh, later federal laws made it, it got rid of those kind of things. <laughs> you know, medical care. There was a clinic in town that, uh, you know, if uh, anybody from the King Ranch had a medical problem, they went there on the ranch. The ranch took care of it, so you had a ranch. You also had the Naval Air Station there, which brought in, you know, people who were maybe shocked by <laughs> the culture they found. And then you had Exxon, Exxon engineers. Uh, were because of the gas plant on the King Ranch. Uh, the ranch, ranch would, was actually going broke when they opened up to let Exxon in in the gas plant. So, so that created a, a kind of a, a, you know, that kept it from being a traditional South Texas town where you had a, you know, clear division between the Anglos and the Mexicans because you did have these other elements introduced into it. Did you, um, you mentioned um, some, some of the uh, Paso, uh, in, in the article you also mentioned other uh, civic and political groups such as uh, Mayo and, and the Latin Unida Party. Uh, what can you tell me about their role in the Chicano movement at A&I and, and to what extent were you involved in those, if at all? The what now? Um, what can you tell me about the Mayo and Raza Unida Party and um, and their role in the Chicano movement at A&I and to what extent were you involved, if at all? Well, uh, actually, uh, the, uh, again, the, the activism, like I say, on campus was, uh, was kind of uh, divided, uh, you know, uh, there were not that many, but uh, with the with the Paso being, you know, kind of Mexican uh, and liberal Anglos, and then that uh, that led to uh, uh, the uh, whoa, 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 whoa. I lost my track of thought here for, for a minute. That that uh, that led to first uh, student politics, not so much concerned with the community. They weren't so concerned with the community. And, and more concerned with student politics. And uh, I mentioned, you know, big things like homecoming queen, right. uh, because uh, Pat Alba, who was from Encinal, he later lived here in Corpus for many years. He's in Austin now, I think he retired to Austin, Patricio Alba. Uh, got uh, this movement. You had, you had the Laredo Club back then, because you had a group from Laredo, you had kids from the valley, you had a different, you know, they, they were making up about a third of the university, but still they were divided, they were not unified. But homecoming queen had always been, uh, uh, you know, the fraternities were competing, the sororities were competing. And uh, that's what Jose Angel uh, brought into this. Uh, that, you know, this organization, if you organize and get behind one candidate, then you could win. And this led to a uh, election of a Mexican-American, I forget her name, but, uh, but uh, then they, uh, they changed the law to have a runoff. 
And again, the Mexicans were not the majority. So Anglo won again, and they threatened to boycott and all that sort of thing. And, they, and, uh, and what happened was student government was taken over by the, uh, by the uh, more radical groups. The first minority student body president was Mary Jo Sanders was black, and uh, she was sharp. Blacks were there, not that many blacks. Now that's another thing about Kingsville, because of the railroad, that we had a black community. You know, you go to the other South Texas towns and then, you know, uh, if they saw a black person, it'd be the first time in their life <laughs> back in those days. But in Kingsville, they had a black community, but not that many students, but uh, I knew them all, because I used to go to the Groovy, that was the club where they went to drink and good student activities. I was young then. But anyway, uh, uh, they, Mary Jo was president and, and this is, they, they pushed through the law, they changed the, I mean the rules on the election of homecoming queen and Pat Alba's sister, Janie Alba, was elected uh, homecoming queen. And Janie lives in San Antonio. I'm still in contact with her. She's she's bright. She was she was married to Emilio Zamora. That was his his first wife. But uh, but uh, Angela Valenzuela is you know his wife now. A very fine lady too. But uh, this was a big dramatic breakthrough for for the you know the election of uh, of a Mexican American homecoming queen. And then uh, the Lantana celebration was a, a, a springtime thing where they had a queen and a court, uh, duchesses or whatever, and uh, Linda Salinas from Alice was elected uh, Lantana queen. And Deanna Bill, Deanna Franco, was, Tony Bill was gonna come over here, but I think because of her health he couldn't today. But uh, he was from up around Kerrville, but uh, very much got very much active in uh, things there. But uh, anyway, they did away with the Lantana celebration as soon as the Mexican American won it. And uh, Linda later married. In fact, I still see her because she married Larry Hufford, who came to South Texas as a Vista volunteer. Now teaches that been teaching for years at St. Mary's in San Antonio. So anyway, they, this kind of things were, were, they were beginning to challenge the, the system. And uh, then uh, again, with the development of Mayo and, uh, and uh, Razonida, uh, this became, became much more politicized. I mean, it became more outside the university. And that's what I talk about in that, in that, in that paper, because uh, uh, Mayo was uh, was uh, uh, founded by uh, several people in San Antonio, Compion and Jose Angel was involved in that. But the chapter there in Kingsville was uh, f uh, founded off campus, really, uh, because of uh, uh, Efrain Fernandez, uh, who I talk about in there, and I thought he might be here too. I don't know, he's still down in the valley. But uh, the Fernandez family had a, a restaurant, El Jardin, and uh, Jose Limon, who's a director of, he used to be at UT Austin, but he's the director of Latin American Studies at Notre Dame. Uh, wrote about the middle class and that sort of thing later uh, and, and, and pointed out how important every town in South Texas, frankly, had a Mexican restaurant where the Anglos went. And this was one of the first areas of contact, really, between Anglos and Mexicans in South Texas was federal installations and the Mexican restaurant. That's what Jose Limon argues. Anyway, El Jardin was uh, the place where the Anglos went for Mexican food. But Efrain 
I was uh, the oldest son, I guess. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned in an article, Ephraim came, had been away, but he came back to Kingsville. And he had a sister who was very, very conservative, very right wing. And uh, Ephraim was very concerned about communism. And uh, he, he became uh, involved. Well, he became a, a visitor with uh, an art professor by the name of Bill Renfro. Uh, Bill and Billy, that was his wife's uh, was named Billy. They lived over in front of the bus station right on the edge, of, in the barrio really. They later moved, but, but uh, Mexican-American art students were, were, were important. Uh, they spent a lot of time with Renfro. And uh, Renfro was, you know, he was not an activist. He was not out leading this, but uh, he was, you know, sympathetic, very much so. And uh, Ephraim became a friend and was visiting with Renfro quite often. And Renfro helped convince him that, you know, there was no big communist threat in South Texas, that the problem was racism, discrimination. And Ephraim got really concerned, and he went out into the barrio and got kids involved. And like I said in that article, I don't remember why I was there, but I was at El Jardin. The back part back then was only opened at night, and we were back in the back. And Ephraim brought some kids in there and formed the local chapter Mayo the Mexican-American Youth Organization. And it was working with the schools, or trying to work in the schools. And uh, it became identified with radicalism. And uh, again, as I, as I mentioned, this is a kind of an interesting case because uh, they, they're very popular and, and uh, South Texas were these kind of wool uh, vest kind of things that you could get. You know, you go to the border fairly often back then. You could get in Mexico in the border towns. And so this became almost like a uniform. And they called them Mayo jackets. And a PE teacher at one of the junior highs gave swats. You still had that in the schools, you know, to any kid that wore a Mayo jacket. And it's kind of interesting because he later in life became an active supporter of, uh, of uh, more radical causes. <laughs> but at that time, no. It was, it was uh, you know, the community uh, didn't support this. Uh, and and they, they were trying to organize the students. And they had, and this led ultimately to a school walkout following the example of, you know, first California, then Ed Cash Olson, then what we had in South Texas. And there was a walkout in Kingsville. And what year was this real quick? Ooh. I don't remember. It's well covered, you know, because the police arrested the people. They had a demonstration downtown. Uh, they, uh, uh, this is what I mentioned. See, Carlos Guerra was a, uh, are you familiar with Carlos? Uh, he wrote a column for the San Antonio and Austin paper for many years. No, I don't think so. Yeah, well, Carlos, Carlos became a very prompt. He became the national director of Mayo and Razunida and all this kind of things. But uh, Carlos, Carlos was from Robstown. Was a, he was, like I say, the first, the second president after Jose Angel of the local Paso chapter. But, uh, but I, Carlos was, a, I was his advisor actually, formal <laughs> advisor, you know, in, in school. And I sent you some pictures the other day. Yeah, yeah. I sent you one of uh, Model OAS with uh, Carlos. Uh, was, uh, we went down to the valley. And uh, yeah, yeah, Carlos, uh, yeah, I knew Carlos real well. Let me go back to that first one, yeah. There's Carlos, uh, and Carlos became very, very prominent in, in, the, in the movement, and, and, and like I said, wrote a column for many years. 
for the San Antonio paper, which was also Kerry Nelson paper, and then he died a few years ago. But uh, Carlos, I saw him on campus, and that's when he found out about the school walkout. Right. They didn't do it. The Mayo kids in the community yeah. did it, but then the university kids got involved and supportive of Mayo. And then Razonita, when uh, Jose Angel formed, you know, started Razonita in Crystal City uh, and had the successes there, you had some involvement in Kingsville, but not a whole lot. But uh, you know, it really, uh, it really. Uh, drove divisions in the, the liberal Democrats. Yeah. I, remember, I remember one of the it's an education professor was a good liberal Democrat like a lot of them. Oh, he told me I couldn't support that Rosa neither that was racist, you know, and all that sort of thing. Why do you think there was that, that division even among Democrats? Because they thought that it was uh, that Rosalinda was a racist group, or radical, too radical, and uh, and so there was a really a, a, a movement away from it. I mentioned in there that even my son was affected by it uh, because uh, my middle son, one of his best friends, told him, "I can't play with you anymore because your father's involved with Rosalinda, supports Rosalinda." <laughs> So, what do you think that is that they saw as radical? They just were afraid of anything like, like. Uh, well, I wouldn't draw too many comparisons to today, but you know, hate and fear is easy to stir up on race, you know, on ethnicity. There's a lot of racism in this society, you know. It's a racist hate. I'm. I'm I hate to say it, but that's obviously what's driving most of the support for Trump today. Racist hate is is uh, fear is is uh, is very much with us, and you saw that with the uh, with the with the development of the movement. But it was that you know it was the fact that we had these students. And increasing numbers of students, and again, it's not that the university was really taking the lead. It's just that where else are they going to go? Uh, that that led me to then develop the uh, the Mexican American history course. I, I want to touch on you mentioned uh, in the article as well. You said that um, how about institutionalized racism and how those in power can do nothing, did, did nothing to help. You said, I don't think the presidents of the university were racist personally, but they supported the system. How is it possible for one to unintentionally support the system? Well, they, they, they did, you know, there were no initiatives to hire minority faculty. They, there were no, you know, the programs that, uh, there was no support for, for that. Um, I use the example of the mariachi too, and uh, you know, they, uh, there, there, there's so much that was, uh, you know, that was happening. Uh, the use of, uh, you know, the the community uh, concerned about bilingual education, that sort of thing. Although A and I became the first doctoral program in bilingual education. Yeah, and uh, and and again, a, a lot of this, uh, this was a, you know, the feelings were very intense. Well, I I, I mentioned uh, El Hardin a while ago, the restaurant, that Efrain, in taking this to the community, got the community involved, and uh, the Mayo kids, some of them from the college, but mainly from the, you know, the public schools. Uh, uh, picketed Exxon. Exxon had a, a building downtown where the engineers were, and they picketed Exxon about their hiring practices uh, because you know they're, the only thing they could come up with was their driveway salesman. In other words, the people that filled your car with gas is about the only place they had any minorities working. But uh, the ranch, and uh, there was never anything written. 
uh, that I know of. But it was, uh, see, the ranch was a big factor and still is in Kingsville. The King Ranch uh, owns a major bank, the lumber company, and has the Exxon gas plant and everything. So anyway, all those people quit going to El Hardin. And, and, you know, it was a, not a formal boycott, but it was obviously a boycott. And the poor Fernandez family, you know, I had no idea what, you know, what, what did we do, you know, because of Efrain's uh, activities. Uh, they were just, you know, destroyed economically. And so this kind of uh, attitude was, was very prevalent. Mm -hmm. Do you think that discouraged? others from, from taking action and trying to vote. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, you know, people whose livelihood depended on on uh, dealing with the uh, dealing with the public. As, as Kingsville was changing, you know, you were developing a middle class Mexican-American, a lot of pharmacists. Somebody needs to do a study on pharmacists and the movement <laughs> because uh, it seemed to be all over. Pharmacists uh, seem to play a key role. Emma Rangel, for example, who, who became the first Mexican-American legis female legislative. Her family had uh, Rangel's pharmacy there in Kingsville. But uh, yeah, they, they, you know, people were put in a difficult position. People, economically, you got to, you know, Do you still think institutionalized racism exists today? To what capacity? That what? Do you think institutionalized racism still exists today? Yeah, I think so. To what capacity? I think I think they're still uh, built into our system. Uh, uh, I think a lot of racism built into our system. And uh, you know, we talk about white privilege and that sort of thing. There, there's uh, there's some element of of truth, fact. You know that we. That uh, you have to, uh, you know, it's changing. But you look at hiring practices. You look at uh, uh, all, all sorts of things. That I think, you know, I think it's uh, still with us. And you know, well, we've had a lot of attention uh, focused on Mexico, for example, racism in Mexico. You know, uh, the. Oscar uh, for the for the movie, the, you know, has brought brought forth all kind of questions about that in Mexico even. But so so it's a very much a part of our society that we we deal with. And this can kind of relates back to um, you know, the restaurant that ended up getting boycotted. What can be done to dis to dismantle this inst institutionalized racism before it still exists? What have I? What, what can be done? To what can be done? Oh, I don't know. You know, I wish I knew. Uh, you know, you can try to, uh, to. Uh, well, it's kind of an oversimplification, I guess, to say, educate people. And uh, you know, how do you teach tolerance? How do you, how do you uh, uh, understand? You can't, you know. Uh, you can't get totally into another culture. I've been told, you know, that I'm, I'm uh, Mexicano de corazón <laughs> by people in Mexico. But you can't totally. You can't. You can't totally put yourself into the the other person where you really see things as they do. But you can. You can try to understand it, and try to help develop understanding. And. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how you would do it. Jumping, I guess, to, to more recent. Um, what did you decide to teach at UTSA? Uh, I, uh, I took early retirement from Kingsville. I taught there 30 years, and then I kind of got burned out a little bit. And I took early retirement. They had a program. Uh, at the time, it doesn't exist anymore, where you, you could uh, teach half-time for five years. And you could do it all in one semester. 
if you could work it out with your department. So that's what I did. I, I took early retirement and taught one semester in Kingsville and then did other. Well, for example, I taught in Mexico for a semester, one of the semesters I was off. I taught at a couple of universities in Mexico. And uh, then I, uh, I, I came to San Antonio and I was a uh, visiting professor at St. Mary's and I had the O'Connor chair at St. Mary's, in fact. I had an endowed chair for a year. I taught a little bit at A&M Kingsville. Uh, but then uh, my marriage fell apart <laughs> and I uh, uh, Ended up moving to Castroville with a new wife, a new life, essentially, and had kind of, uh, you know, quit more or less teaching. But I got a call one August from uh, from the political science <laughs> department at UTSA, and they needed somebody desperately. And I'd been recommended by I'd been recommended actually by Larry Hufford, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, was came to South Texas as a VISTA volunteer, but it's become a very good, very good professor. But anyway, so I, I took the job, and I just been there ever since, teaching political science. And I'm not a political scientist, but uh, you know, so I teach. You know, I teach usually. It gets. I enjoy it. I still enjoy it, and it gets me out of the house. Usually a couple of days a week. Now recently, it's uh, the Latin Americanist. Uh, you know, I was I teaching intro courses, but the Latin Americanist uh, left, and uh, they haven't been able to get the funding to fill that position. So I've been teaching the upper level courses in Latin America, which I enjoy more. You know, because of, even though I'm not a political scientist, and uh, maybe give too much of a historical bent to it, it's it's more my area. And you know, I'm still active as a as a historian of Mexico. I uh, I wanted to jump back a little bit. Uh, I never asked you. It's something I wanted to. When did you learn Spanish? When did I learn Spanish? Yeah. I'm learning Spanish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I uh, I went to uh, uh, I, I took uh, well I had some. In, I had some classes. I didn't do well in them, uh, but I, I had some uh, uh, classes in, in Cuernavaca, which uh, for time was the place to study Spanish. And then uh, when I was in uh, when I was in uh, uh, Kingsville, one of the many things I did. I, I, when I was active, I was very active in a lot of organizations and uh, grant programs and things like that. But but uh, my wife at the time was a sociology professor, and we proposed a uh, a faculty uh, development program called Transculturation of Faculty at a Minority Institution. And and uh, we got funding from FIPSI, that uh, was part of the Department of Education, the Fund for the Improvement of uh, Post-Secondary Education. And, and the, the program was a semester-long seminar and followed by a immersion program in Cuernavaca. And so we did that 12 years. So every, every May I was in Cuernavaca, so I took classes. I took classes. My Spanish, you know, I've taught. I've taught in Spanish. I gave a talk in in Ciudad Juarez in September in Spanish. So you know, my Spanish is not perfect, but uh, you picked it up I, I can I can communicate. And you know, my like I, I mentioned, one of my books was translated by the Mexican government a couple of years ago, and we had a presentation in Mexico City, and I spoke in Spanish. So I, you know, I can. I can get by. I can make myself understood. I gave a. This it gets back to Mexican American history too. Yeah. 
because I first started thinking about this many years ago in, in connection with Flores Magoon because they spent a lot of years in the U.S. Uh, and Flores Magoon died in Leavenworth and several other the Magonista leaders were in the U.S. and they became aware of the uh, discrimination and wrote about it and talked about it. And so many years ago, I did a paper on Magonismo as precursor to Chicanismo. And one of the Mexican scholars who was expert on Flores Magón was horrified that I would associate Flores Magón with Mexican Americans, you know, because of that. Uh, but then as times changed, I went to a, I was at a conference in Oaxaca uh, many years later and did an updated version of that paper. And it was well received. In fact, it was the uh, one of the Mexican newspapers public, publicized all over the country. You know, the article was covered all over the country. They interviewed me because it became you know very much acceptable and is now much more. You know, the, the, there's in fact there was a an exhibit in Los Angeles just a couple of months ago on magonismo in the United States. So so that's. Uh, I had to, uh, you know, if I was going to pretend to be a Mexican historian, I should try to speak the language. I understand. Do you, um, do you see that, that trend kind of continuing, like being more accepted as in people wanting to study Mexican-American history? And, and I think so. I think so. You know, Emilio Zamora, for example, is a good example. Emilio is published widely. But he's one of the first Mexican-American scholars who really was well-grounded in Mexican history and spent time in Mexico. And I, I see more of that. I see more of the, the uh, interrelationship. Um, I guess the question is, um, kind of towards the end of the questions I have, is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you, you um, wish I would or you'd like to speak more about? No, no, the only thing is, you know, that I was in a fortunate position uh, to develop the course of Mexican-American uh, history, which, as I, as I say, is, a, as far as I know, is the first one taught in Texas at a college level. And, uh, and you know, it's still, still I've gotten, it, it's humbling, but people like Ignacio Garcia, who retired from Brigham Young, published on Razonita, for example. It was, uh, you know, gives me a lot of credit for getting him started. He was my student. Victor Nelson here was one of my students. And at first, he established the Ethnic Studies program at, uh, at A&I, and then was at Colorado College for many years. Emilio was, uh, you know, Isidro Ortiz at uh, San Diego State. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, good students that come out of this, so it's very rewarding in that sense. That you know, it's a, I haven't. Again, my my research interest has continued to be Mexican history, but I help. I think I've helped develop uh, an interest, uh, some significant movement in Mexican American history. I want to ask. My memory just jogged. You, you mentioned Emilio Zamora often, and. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with recently the uh, the Texas Board of Education made it to where uh, they're going to have an elective of Mexican American Studies in high school courses. Yeah, that, 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 he's been very important in that, and so has Andres Tijerino. Right. I don't know if you know him, but he's at Austin Community College. I, I, I but that. Andres is uh, Andres is uh, Andres taught at Kingsville, and he's he's he's. Uh, I don't know if you you talk to get. Uh, to talk to him, but uh, he uh, he stayed out of academics for a while after he got his uh, doctorate uh, because it was well, it was changing. A lot of things went into that. But anyway, when he got back in, he came. He was hired in Kingsville, but he. He, he's, a, he's an example. I don't know if you get him to talk about this. And he's never really said that to me. But he's an example of how they, they really didn't make uh, minorities comfortable, faculty, minority faculty. And, uh, you know, he 
went back to Austin. Well, he had contacts, ties in Austin. And I'm not saying that that was the sole cause, but, uh, but you know, it, it, it is a, uh, it's, it's an obstacle. We're talking about Kingsville. See, I was, I did everything there over the years. I was chair of the department for a while. I was a faculty senate chair. I was this and that. And uh, I, I remember one time I said, you know, we need to put minorities in the classroom. It's important. I said, look, we pay engineering professors more than we pay English professors, you know, we pay business professors more than we pay, well, always English. <laughs> but, you know, because they're hard to get, but you need them, so you got to pay more. I said, so maybe we need to do that with minorities. Oh, God, they thought I was crazy. You know, that, uh, they say, no, oh, no way, we can't do that. That's uh, discrimination, that's uh, racist, you know. And and so you know that sort of thing is is uh, it's it's part of the uh, part of the problem I think. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, to bring that up because I, I want to ask a question. Um, do you what, what do you think the importance is in having more people uh, aware of, of Mexican American history? I think uh, well obviously that uh, all history. <laughs> My wife's teaching. Uh, AP World History in high school, and uh, the main thing she does is uh, make me know how little I know about <laughs> a lot of a lot of history of uh, the Middle East or the Far East or a lot of areas that you know I feel really stupid that I knew I need to know you need to know your history you need to know the history to uh, to uh, understand positions understand the issues, understand the problems, and, and uh, you know, the minorities in American history are, are very important. And uh, I think it uh, affects the way we, we deal with things everywhere. Well, Professor Arlo, thank you so much. Okay. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you for sitting here.